and welcome to the Alatir Foundation's new podcast series where experts share their insights on current and urgent energy matters for the benefits of the Foundation's members and the general community. My name is Nawid Jabarkil and I'm joined today by Braulio Pickman, Technical Director at ERM, Sustainability, Energy and Climate Change, to discuss this important topic. Braulio is currently based in Sao Paulo and has been with ERM since 2008. He provides specialist sustainability and technical services for companies in the public and private sectors, as well as to cities and countries. He's also a consultant for the UN's Framework Convention on Climate Change since 2005, working for the Clean Development Mechanism and as an expert reviewer for national inventories. Before the interview begins, I'd like to remind all of our listeners to please visit the Foundation's website at www.abhafoundation.org. For the latest reports, you can also follow the Foundation on Twitter at Alatia FNDN. Right, well today then, as countries continue to ramp up their climate change ambitions, the use of coal for energy generation is expected to drop significantly. As a result, the role of natural gas is set to be enhanced, as burning it produces less greenhouse gas emissions than burning coal and crude oil. Natural gas is therefore often considered the cleanest fossil fuel. But methane emissions from the production, transport and use of natural gas present a challenge to the sustainability credentials of the industry. For gas to be widely accepted as more climate friendly than coal, companies producing, processing and moving gas around need to ensure that methane leaks are kept to a minimum. The International Energy Agency identified reducing upstream emissions as one of five key policy priorities in the energy sector if the world is to achieve the goal of the Paris Agreement. Good afternoon, Braulio, and welcome to an Alatia Foundation activity. Hello, Nawid. It's a pleasure to be here again with the Alatia Foundation. Thank you. Let's begin then by looking at how big the problem we're discussing today is. Can you give us a perspective into, first of all, the size of the challenge when it comes to methane emissions? Yeah, so methane emissions, there are different sources of information and they account for those emissions in different ways. So in principle, we believe that those emissions could represent uh, between 20 and 25 percent of global overall emissions, depending on the way you account for them. Uh, and, and they have a huge potential for mitigation because in many cases, like in the oil and gas sector, they are concentrated in uh, a limited number of sources of emissions. And just shifting to where we are now then, that's quite a big figure, 20 to 25 percent. Tell us a bit more about the current state of play then with regards to, yeah. to those emissions. What, what are the main sources, for example, what's being done and, and where are the gaps? Yeah, following the IPCC uh, criteria, the main source of methane emissions is enteric fermentation from uh, raising cattle and followed by the oil and gas sector. I would say Enteric fermentation may represent approximately 30% of the global emissions of uh, uh, methane. Oil and gas is probably coming very close to it, another 30%. And this is where you find the, the, the most uh, relevant opportunities to mitigation. Although, like I said, in enteric fermentation, it's uh, widespread, you don't have concentrated sources of emissions like you have in the oil and gas sector. And that's followed by uh, landfills, uh, 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 wastewater treatment and agriculture with uh, other sources from agriculture like manure management with uh, uh, smaller values in terms of emissions. We have a problem related to the way we account for that. Uh, and the recent years, they were especially fruitful in this regard because we are now using remote sensing satellite imagery to identify hotspots in terms of methane emissions and we can identify that we most likely are underestimating emissions from the oil and gas industry mainly from the oil and gas from the oil sector because of flaring activity. So uh, flaring is understood as being almost 100% efficient 
and the actual measurements are demonstrating that open flares are not. So there is now a trend to migrate from open to enclosed flares in the industry, uh, and that could deliver a significant reduction that is not being accounted for because of the way we calculate those emissions nowadays. And just to pick up on that, is that a measurement issue? Is it a reporting issue? What what accounts for the for that missing figure in the, in the uh, industry? You know, you know, uh, uh, we don't measure emissions from open flares. It's almost impossible. Uh, it's a technical challenge. There were attempts to do it, but that does not happen. Uh, and we can measure from enclosed flares. And enclosed flares, we know that they work like a combustion chamber, so they destroy everything. Uh, but open flares, we just have some academic studies, uh, mainly from Canada in the University of Alberta and other uh, studies with wind tunnels, and they deliver results that demonstrate efficiency is not so high. And now with satellite imagery, this is being confirmed and that's why many uh, oil companies uh, are promoting this replacement, this change, which requires investment, but uh, it's a technology that's that's already available. But this is just one source of emissions. Then you have venting, you have operational practices, you have uh, fugitive emissions, but those are probably uh, of lower significance. In the yeah, sense. and it's... It it's interesting that when you uh, laid out the the, the state of, of of play at the moment, it seems like there's some uh, elements where individuals can play a role uh, a lot, where businesses and industry can, but then also governments as well. What are the major issues, in your uh, opinion, when it comes to methane abatement that need to be addressed by those groups, particularly industry and government? Well, I believe there is one is is the policy aspect. Uh, the 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 way carbon markets can help or regulatory targets could help in, in driving the changes. This is the policy uh, uh, side of the discussion, and I believe we have less control over it. And then you have corporate initiatives, the sector, which I think it's, it's working hard. I would say the most relevant uh, oil and gas companies they are making a big effort in terms of controlling their emissions and, and measuring the footprint of their products. So besides inventories that are being conducted by these companies, many of them are now working with what we call of uh, uh, streamlined LCA, CO2, carbon footprint of their products. You have many producers of LNG working with the idea of carbon neutral LNG. So uh, this requires a lot of effort in terms of monitoring and, and mitigating emissions. But this is this is a, a huge opportunity for for those companies and it's it's already happening. And uh, obviously, given your your role, you 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 look work a lot with national governments and multinational agencies as well. Do you feel if you try and take the carrot and stick analogy, is the stick strong enough today? Do you think, or do, do you think the governments and 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 multinational corporations need to get tougher, or the agencies at least? I I would say that we have this big problem with carbon markets. This is lack of definition of of the negotiations. We have now a conference happening in November. Uh, the perspectives for Article 6.4 that could lead to a carbon market that would be an opportunity to provide incentives for investments that may not be feasible today. So enclosed flares could be one case for small installations. Uh, vapor recovery systems could be another alternative that could be fostered by carbon markets. Uh, however, the negotiations, I would say they are still stuck. Uh, they may progress on the side of the government, which is Article 6.2, but carbon markets, they, they really are still facing some uh, uh, barriers, resistance, either from governments or from uh, independent entities, NGOs, uh, stakeholders in general. So we don't know what's going to happen. And that could be uh, an opportunity to trigger uh, new 
technologies in terms of uh, avoiding uh, methane emissions in the value chain for production of natural gas, be it LNG and it must or, be said, or natural gas. Sorry. Yeah, and it must be said that lots of governments and, and organizations are prioritizing this issue. I mean, you just need to turn on the television or look at a, a newspaper to, 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 to see that. But the UN also, this is a key year for the, for the UN, with, particularly with the COP26 climate change conference taking place in the UK. A lot of momentum behind this now. Uh, you're involved, you've been involved with that fra framework convention on climate change I mentioned earlier and the methodology panel in particular. Just tell, mm -hmm. give us some insights into the work of this panel and the baseline uh, methodologies, monitoring methodologies being developed for trying to reduce emissions. Yeah, what's being discussed under the clean development mechanism is how it will migrate to generate a new mechanism some people call it sustainable development mechanism that could be adopted by all countries in the world and uh, subsidize the future carbon market with a framework that's uh, under the control of United Nations. So that's happening in parallel to all the, voluntar to all the voluntary initiatives that are ongoing in the world. Uh, so in the CDM, what's being done right now is an attempt to adjust methodologies to perfection them in order to them to serve to this new uh, framework and for the oil and gas sector there are a number of methodologies that were approved through the years they are being updated uh, and we do have I believe the last methodology to be approved uh, it will be one for uh, avoidance of uh, methane losses in, in oil and gas facilities. So it's for reduction of emissions from methane from tanks uh, in oil production facilities uh, and fugitive emissions of methane in the same operations. So we do have now, uh, it's, it's about to be approved a new methodology in, in this field. Great. And just looking at the the analogy I touched on earlier, moving away from the stick and looking at the carrot, I mean, a lot of businesses, one thing they do tend to understand is the bottom line. And it's generally thought that there's a compelling economic argument here as well, uh, perhaps even something that can generate revenue for businesses with some 60 percent of reduction measures reportedly making economic sense. But we're not really seeing this happen at scale at the moment. Why, why do you think that is? What's holding businesses back from prioritizing this issue? Uh I, I would say that this is changing right now. I believe uh, the biggest companies in this sector, they are investing in, in this. So methane is a product. It's the main component of natural gas. There will always be a value in recovering it. Uh, sometimes you have a significant level of investments to obtain small reductions and that's why you need uh, to foster that with external incentives like carbon markets it's not the only one you could have subsidies uh, tax reduction schemes but again there is a lot of opposition uh, from people who may not understand the need that we have for a transition fuel for a low carbon economy and the role that natural gas can still play in the next 20 to 30 years. And you mentioned carbon markets there. We saw uh, just recently, in recent weeks, China launching the world's largest one. The European Union has a lot of experience relatively in, in the sector going back to uh, almost 15 years now. Considering what we've just been discussing, how important a role do you think carbon markets can play in the reduction of, of greenhouse gas emissions? Do they work? I believe carbon markets can play an important role by driving the introduction of new technologies. And there, after that, scaling up, it's, it's the responsibility of the companies in that market. So these initial steps, which are fundamental, without the initial step, you never will progress towards anywhere. Uh, you, you, you could rely much more on carbon markets. But like I said, this is still uh, lock it. The negotiations must progress so that we can uh, have uh, some development in in this in this field. 
And just uh, going back to the, the work of the Convention and the United Nations on the issue, do you see consensus around the world in terms of this from major markets, major economies, uh, major governments, particularly given how multipolar the world feels right now? Is this an issue that really everyone's agreed on? Yeah, I believe this multipolar world cannot agree on anything. So consensus is just a, an ideal. But what I would say is most countries are convinced that we must uh, uh, follow the, the mantra of the Paris Agreement, which is far below two degrees Celsius. Uh, and this is actually happening. So it's not, it may not be happening with the speed that people would like. It may require adaptation measures because the, the limitation in greenhouse gas emissions will not happen as we would like it to happen. Uh, but, but it's moving forward. And, and I believe that it, despite the fact that carbon markets may not progress with the speed we would like to see it, uh, there are other initiatives and I believe the corporate side is, is working hard in this regard, private sector. Uh, some governments are aware of it, but some are not, and there is nothing we can do about that except vote. Uh, so I would be moderately optimistic in, in this regard. Moderately optimistic. And I'm just going to ask you for, for another projection to finish off then, Braulio. Based on your extensive expertise and with your crystal ball still in your hand, uh, are you confident that the so-called methane conundrum will ever be completely resolved? And, and what do you see, uh, what role do you see for the natural gas industry in the next 30 years? Yeah, I, I am. Uh, my crystal crystal ball is always optimistic. So I believe the fact that we now have satellite imagery to identify sources of methane uh, is really providing elements for the industry to focus on the reductions in the right places. And this is something that's starting to happen uh, globally. Uh, we still have differences in different geographies. Some countries, they do not uh, control uh, the industry as they should, but uh, this is again improving year by year. And because mitigation is moving forward, I believe the footprint of natural gas will be reduced and then the problem that remains is the combustion of natural gas and to that end i see a huge potential it's not a small potential it's a huge potential for natural gas to produce electricity in the most efficient way so combined cycle systems are achieving 63 65 percent of efficiency and if you produce electricity and use that electricity to replace gasoline and diesel in the transportation sector, I think that's the most effective way to fasten uh, greenhouse gas emissions reduction. So the focus today is in the transportation sector. And if we can speed up the process of electrification in that sector, that will be uh, a significant step forward in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And electricity being produced by natural gas can deliver a very efficient package, especially in comparison to uh, 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 fossil fuels being used, liquid fossil fuels being used in the transportation sector. They are not uh, as efficient as solar and wind, but solar and wind still will take decades until they can meet the whole capacity and they still have the problem of storage of electricity which natural gas does not have so i i see for the next 20 to 30 years we could rely heavily on natural gas uh, for producing electricity and we still have another opportunity which is related to carbon capture and storage when you said centralize the production of energy in one single facility and you do have a reservoir where you can store the CO2, well, then you, you become almost uh, uh, carbon neutral in the entire cycle. So this is the opportunity I see and this is worth investing in, in my view. Yes.
some some really interesting opportunities as you've mentioned there uh, carbon capture the technology use of technology and also um, with regards to transportation and electricity just a quick mention for our uh, listeners, there are previous podcasts on the Foundation's uh, website. You can probably find them or, or look through the, the YouTube page and you'll be able to find some uh, more uh, expertise uh, on previous podcasts. Again, a reminder, the uh, website is www.abhafoundation.org. Well, our time has whizzed through, Braulio. Thank you so much for your insights and your time as well today. A quick recap then for listeners. We've been hearing about how methane remains one of the most difficult conundrums for the gas industry, but efforts certainly underway to try and reduce the harms and to ultimately help address climate change. And Braulio also finishing on a somewhat positive note for gas with his crystal ball. That's all we have time for today. Watch this space for the next Alatia podcast in the series. I'm Nawid Jabarkil. Thank you and goodbye. 